You may try these. Yeah. Gum. Oh, it's really, really, really good. good. It's, it's, it's like a meringue with chocolate chips. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's really easy to do. Wow. It's really good. Good. It's really good. It's like 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 good. It's Go after it. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I may do that. Everybody's ranting, ready to know, bro. I know. There's probably not any left. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Probably. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you all. I've been over here for a while doing battle with technology, and as usual, I lost. So, oh. what may you do? <laughs> um, I know, but we're going to be um, continuing our study of John this morning. Uh, I know many of you weren't here last week. You were up supporting uh, Ashley and hearing her preach. I heard that that was a wonderful sermon, and I, I wish I could have gone as well. I'm grateful that this parish is continuing to support Ashley, and I'll be real interested to see what's next for her. She'll be graduating very soon. I'm assuming if the diocese sticks to its uh, to the pattern that it's had for a while, that she'll probably be ordained to the diaconate out at the cathedral in Houston sometime in June. Late June is usually now. Well, anyways, it's an exciting and I'm sure very stressful time for her. Yeah. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks and praise for this day. We thank you for gathering us together uh, to worship uh, and also to study your word, to learn from your holy scriptures, to learn from the example that your son, Jesus Christ, set for us to study his teachings that we might live our lives in accord with your will. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah. So, um, again, last week we kind of had a, a broad overview of the Gospel of John. I think most of you are familiar with that stuff. Um, the uniqueness of John. We talked a little bit about the two-source hypothesis about the sources for Matthew, Mark, and Luke is coming, you know, Mark and Q are the earliest known uh, Gospels to have been written. Matthew and Luke drew heavily from those two source materials. Uh, John, the, the authorship of John is kind of mysterious. It is widely regarded as having been the last of the canonical Gospels written, uh, and it's completely different from any of the, what are known as the synoptic Gospels. Completely different. Um, I doubt that the author of John even had access to any of the synoptic gospels. There's almost nothing um, that is really incorporated, even, even the events. You've got some of the main events of Jesus' life, his baptism, um, the feeding of the 5,000, uh, some of those, you know, crucifixion, of course. Um, but other than that, John is just very, very different. Doesn't have any parables. Uh, instead has different I am statements. We'll be taking a deeper dive uh, into those eventually. And by the time John is written or within that context, there seems to have been uh, a break in the relationship between the, the, the Christian Jews and what became rabbinic Judaism, it was kind of the Pharisaic movement. Um, and so you have this kind of animosity uh, that's pretty evident in the Gospel of John towards the Jews. It's not, the critique is not uh, the Jewish leadership as it is in, in most of the other Gospels. It's just the Jews. So that's a question. Yeah, please. How come John is before Mark and Luke and all that? Why is he behind them? In the, in the, in in the, the, in the canonical Bible. order in the Bible, John is the last. It is behind them. 
Okay. And on, uh, most biblical scholars, again, the, the authorship of all the Gospels is unknown, but most of the biblical scholars probably will refer to the uh, Gospel of John simply as the fourth Gospel. Again, just because it doesn't say anywhere in, in John who the beloved disciple was, who it is who's actually writing these stories down. Um, so there's a lot that you don't know. For those of you who were here last week, I suggested the possibility of, you know, reading through John and maybe even reading John and Mark side by side, since these are the two uh, main uh, gospel sources for this uh, liturgical year. Did anybody do that? Did you? Oh, awesome. What did y'all notice from uh, from doing this? Did anything, did, did anything jump out at you? Well, they were distinctly different, like we said. I don't say that. And I probably should have gone back and made comparisons. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that when, um, when Judas is called out, in John, Jesus hands him, literally comes and hands him the bread and says, you will betray me. Um, in the other Gospels, I noticed I have to hear it now. He was done. They they don't call him out like Jesus doesn't call him out like that. Mm -hmm. He says there will be someone that will betray me. He still comes. He doesn't in those gospels. He doesn't go and say it's in a tube. Right. <laughs> right. So, I thought that was going to be It is, and it's consistent with John in a way, in which Jesus is betrayed, but he's also kind of in control of everything. Um, so everything is happening in a way that Jesus knows about. It's almost as if he's telling Judas, you know, okay, it's time to betray me. You'll see the same thing throughout his crucifixion, you know. He's being questioned by Pilate, but it's very clear that, that Jesus is in control of it. And even at the when he's crucified, you know, that, that's a great place to notice some of these differences. In Mark, um, Jesus' last words are, my God, my God, why are you forsaken? And then he dies. In John, uh, he says, it is finished, I think. Yeah. And then he gave up his spirit. He didn't die. He shook, you know, he, again, he's in control of the whole thing. Um, so, yeah. Can I have a question? Mm -hmm. um, don't you think, I mean, in what you just said, the his accusers, that had to be, they weren't, they weren't unworthy people. They had to be perplexing to the people in charge who were condemning them, saying, if you are the son of God, you know, show yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jesus was just, you know, yeah. He was just so focused on being real at friends and jobless. From, from mm -hmm. and they, had to be, they were seeking, they were searching what's wrong with this guy because mm -hmm. they couldn't find any problem. So, maybe that's just a problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would feel free. The feminist is accusers who are not being able to understand. Then the crowd can tell you the names. Yeah, and you've kind of got. A lot of people sharing in culpability. I think John is going to put most of the blame simply on the Jews. Um, John is going to go out of his way to um, kind of excuse Pilate almost. Um, you know, and we don't know a whole lot about Pontius Pilate, but I think all the historical evidence we have suggests that he was a monster. He was, he was a really bad dude. Um, but John wants to place the blame on the Jews rather than on Pilate. The Jews did not have the authority to crucify a person. Um, that, that was done by the Roman Empire. But you'll have a sense in reading through it. I, I'd have to look through them all again. But Jesus is going to be arrested. He's going to be condemned by the Jewish leadership, by the temple leadership, the Sanhedrin. Um, 
who are then going to hand him over to an empire who ultimately is going to have the power to, to crucify him or not. Yeah. And Mark, I mean, he's really, you know, but Jesus is really kind of a victim. He really is. He's sold out. He, he dies along. His disciples um, flee when he's arrested. And in Mark, they never come back. They are never. There's the sense of reconciliation after the after the resurrection and other gospels, but not at all. You know, the of beauty. Any other things that y'all noticed about uh, Mark and John side by side? <laughs> uh, don't you hate it when that happens? <laughs> I always heard that if you want to know the Bible, read John. Hmm. That's interesting. That's interesting. Did, did that, like, did that elaborate on that? Uh-uh. Mm -hmm. yeah, it surprises me. Or he said Matthew, maybe. Yeah. I don't yeah, and and you know the Bible contains a lot of different themes, of course, but even just focusing on the four Gospels, they are so distinct. I mean, it's just amazing how how different they are. And I was gonna say, like you had talked about in Mark, Jesus is clearly a, a victim, mm -hmm. uh, and but for John, this is the glorification. That's right. Right. I mean, it's, what, what could be more different? Uh -huh. It's the whole thing. It's the crucifixion and the resurrection. I don't think he has. Does he? Yeah, he has an ascension. Um, all of it's the glorification. So interesting. And I don't know if anyone else has heard this, but I've I've read this before. Um, different articles through the years. People who are not Christian. Jesus's crucifixion can be a real stumbling block for them. And that, and I'm thinking particularly, I've, I've seen more than one person think Jesus just committed suicide. Like he went like a lamb to the slaughter. He didn't have to. And um, and that, you know, clearly in John, throughout this whole gospel, Jesus picks up his life and he lays it down. Like you said, Jesus is always control and and this is part of the revelation the glory that's revealed in, in this whole passion resurrection message so i just wanted to yeah yeah has anyone else ever heard that they're not but this whole crucifixion is a stumbling block well because because the, 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 there's just not the people of faith and the, the faith in front of the Holy Spirit, she be seeking people. And, you know, they have to talk about the and the bird. It's just questions that they derive from people asking. What do you think about that John is spent time here with Jesus? You know, he was kind of there from the beginning, so he, he understood. Maybe at the, at the time, but he had a better chance of understanding that this was what's supposed to happen. And Jesus kept telling him this is what's going to happen. Right. So it just seemed like it gave him a better chance of understanding this is had to happen. Yeah, and it's it's important to remember that all of these gospels are written from a post-resurrection perspective. So they're they're. Uh, the events, you know, these disciples don't know what the hell is going on and they get it wrong every time. Now they're having the opportunity to reflect back uh, through the lens of resurrection. And you see that, sure, in today's gospel you guys were heard of Jack, that someone's in the temple. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus is asked, by what sign do you do these things? And he calls himself the temple. Mm -hmm. And of course, they're also writing after the physical team has been in Right. Mm -hmm. It's just so interesting. 
And then, of course, the cleansing of the temple is a great example of the difference between God and some of the other Gospels. John, this is really one of Jesus' first public acts, is to go to Jerusalem and to, you know, have what's known as biblical scholars as uh, the temple tantrum. So this really begins his, his public ministry. In, the, uh, in all the other Gospels, it ends his public ministry. So in, in John, Jesus goes to Jerusalem, cleanses the temple, leaves, goes back, leaves, goes back. And so Jesus uh, returns to Jerusalem a, a number of years uh, for Passover. And so his public ministry, uh, as John depicts it, was somewhere between three and four years. Um, all the other gospel accounts, I think, uh, in Luke, Jesus is taken to uh, Jerusalem as a child, but then after he, he begins his public ministry, he spends his whole time um, in Judea and uh, in, in kind of in Galilee. And then eventually, um, after about a year, then he goes to Jerusalem for the Passover where he's crucified. So, and so that's where the cleansing of the temple takes place, is at the very end of his story. Uh, he has the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, cleanses the temple. Um, so it's a very, very different. You've got this, uh, in Mark anyways, but in all the synoptics, the sense of Jesus is he's spending all this time in his home region of Galilee, and then he sets his face towards Jerusalem, and you know, okay, there's a big showdown. This is where the temple leadership is that Jesus has been uh, criticizing, and this is not going to go well. But that's very different from, from how John is set this kind of back and forth movement. Well, so any other things that people notice? We talked about this before, but just the tone is very, very different. And just the way Jesus presents himself. Last week, we focused on the first part of John. And John has been broken up uh, by biblical scholars and was probably intended on some level to be kind of uh, two books in one. So we call the first book the Book of Signs. And Jesus performs signs. And it's not the way that. Jesus performs signs in the other gospels. He's going on, he is, um, in, in Mark, Jesus goes around healing like crazy. It's just, it's all action. Healing, 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 healing. John has three healings, I believe. And each time he heals somebody, then there's this long explanation about what it means. So it's very, very different. Yeah. So the, the, the miracles are intended to be signs which point to Jesus divinity. So that's what Jesus is going to talk about every time he heals somebody. The story of the man born blind, I mean, that, that story goes on forever. Um, just, you know, Mark would have just said, they brought Jesus a blind man and he healed him. And then he's going to move on to something else. That's not the way John works. Um, so you've got these... Uh, so, and then the second half uh, is generally called the Book of Glory, and this is what what Claire talks about the, the, the glorification. And in John, really, the, the glorification is everything from incarnation to crucifixion to resurrection to ascension. The, the, these are all kind of part of one movement, um, but the where you really start to see that that glorification being come out. Uh, is going to be in the second half of John. So if, if you start reading once John, uh, once Jesus has entered Jerusalem for that last time, you're going to see that word glory and glorification a lot. The, the pivot point in John's gospel is the raising of Lazarus, um, which in a sense encapsulates the whole story of Jesus from John's perspective, um, which could be summarized as Jesus laying down his life for his friends and kids. So, 
Remember that Jesus hears that Lazarus is sick in Bethany, um, which is just a little bit to the east of Jerusalem. So he's going, now we know he's going close to where the, the, the powers are that are plotting against him. And he's doing that in order to uh, heal, or it turns out to raise his friend. And so we see Jesus kind of giving up his life by going into the area of Jerusalem where he's he's going to be arrested and killed so that he can raise Lazarus. So in a way, it does kind of encapsulate the whole, the whole gospel uh, and then moves us into the book of glory. I don't know if we have a whole lot of records about uh, Bethany and the, I think Bethany has long ago ceased to exist under that name. The The modern day name, I, I can't remember what it is. It's an Arabic word, um, which means literally the place of Lazarus. Mm -hmm. it's, it's what that place is called now. Do you remember what it's called? All I remember is that it, it means the place of Lazarus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you been there? I did not go. Um, some folks from our troop did, um, just a few of them. And I think that, you know, a lot of these holy places have been assigned a location. You know, we don't necessarily really know that that was the actual location. But um, anyway, supposedly, you know, there's the house there with Martha and Lazarus. One of the things that's interesting, just thinking of another place, and I think this is true of a place in Bethany, um, is the the tomb is like, you know, not even a stone's throw away. <clears throat> Sometimes the home was here, and the tombs were down here. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. It's not like driving to the cemetery. Right. You know, <laughs> Uh -huh. Although you do, I mean, you do see the, the stones that are rolled in front of you. Yeah, but then they'll roll them back open, put some more people in, and you want to shine. I always thought that uh, Lazarus and Mary and Martha as a family, and that was always a safe place for Jesus to go. He probably went there more than once, I guess. And I almost think they were probably part of Mary's extended family. And so it was, and I have no idea where you would find any evidence of that. I'm just sort of reading through the lines. The, the wedding at Cana, the same thing. That was Mary's family. So and, and the world's pretty small. But that was always a safe, very safe place for Jesus to go because of the family relationship. So when uh, Lazarus died. I mean, that was extremely difficult for Jesus. I mean, he was fully human and he grieved just like we all do when that, when that happened. But it was also the setup. It had to happen and he knew it had to happen and that's why he waited because it was it's trying to get through the through the, the, the disciples of this was going to be me a week from now, you know, type of, type of thing. But, uh, it's, uh, and I always, I love the thing that I guess for me in the, in the story, uh, Mary Magdalene in the garden after the um, resurrection, and she took Jesus for the gardener. Right. And for me, linking the way this book of John starts, it's in the beginning, takes you all the way back to the Garden of Gethsemane, or the Garden of Eden. And in a sense, he was the Garden of Standing, because it's a connection of the, 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 the new creation. So there's some linkages that I think are important and those symbols you know they kind of you, you stand back and some days you say oh i saw that you know, 
Yeah, and clearly intended by the author. The, 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 the beginning part, the garden part. And usually on for our, our great vigil on Easter, we usually use the, the text from the Gospel of John. Uh, and so to be celebrating Easter with that Bill Hanine text out in the courtyard uh, is, I think, is awesome. I love it. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we'll get decent weather again this year. Have that, have that sunrise. Uh, great visuals. Yeah, and you mentioned kind of the, the humanness of Jesus at, at the death of his friend. Mm -hmm. in, in the Gospel of John, that's one of the only places you see that humanness. He's not very uh, he's not very relatable by and large, in my opinion, Jesus is it. And so that in a way that makes that scene of Jesus weeping even more powerful within the non of John. Yeah. Yeah, he sure seems to have been. <laughs> oh. Let's take a break. I'm gonna try to um try to figure out how to do this with the screen share that I could. So I think I should be able just to show you this video. Last week we watched part one of the Bible project uh, video about the Gospel of John. And so we're going to watch part two, which is going to focus on the Book of Glory. And, you know, as I said last week, this is presented in a way that's very easy to understand. Uh, it's very, very well done. And it's also extremely dense. So you may want to go back and watch this again, because there's a, a lot of stuff crammed into um, one short video, but uh, I definitely commend uh, the Bible Project to you if you if you're looking for good uh, good information on the Bible. It's, you know, as, as we said last week, the production value is excellent, and the content is equally excellent. It's, these are very very well done. So this is part two. Uh, about the Gospel of John, and you talk about the The Gospel according to John. In the first video, we saw that John wrote this book to make the claim that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the human embodiment of God's word and glorious presence, who has come to reveal who God truly is. Then we explored how John designed the first half of the book to demonstrate this. Jesus performed miraculous signs and made huge claims about himself, that he is the reality to which Israel's entire history points. And this all generates controversy, however, and the Jewish leaders confront Jesus for all these claims, and it culminated with Jesus laying down his life for his friend Lazarus. By going near Jerusalem to raise him from the dead, Jesus sealed his fate. And so once the plot to murder Jesus is set in motion, we come into the book's second the first part focuses entirely on Jesus' final night and last words to the disciples as he tries to prepare them for his coming kind of death. Jesus performs this shocking act at dinner. He takes on the role of a common servant by kneeling down to wash their dirty feet, something that in their culture a superior rabbi would never do for his disciples. And Jesus says it's a symbol of his entire life purpose to reveal the true nature of God as a being of self giving love. And it's also a symbol of what Jesus is about to do in becoming a servant and giving up his life to die. And so this act leads to his great command to his disciples that they are to follow him by loving one another as he has loved them. Acts of loving generosity are to be the hallmark of Jesus' followers. This is what will show the world who Jesus is and therefore who God is. And from here, Jesus goes into a long, flowing speech that's concluded with a prayer. And you'll find the whole thing is unified by a few repeated themes. Jesus keeps saying that he's going away, which makes the disciples sad. But Jesus says it's for the best because it means that he will send the Spirit, also known as the Advocate. As a human, Jesus can only be in one place at a time. But the Spirit can be Jesus' divine, personal presence in any place at any time. And the Spirit will do a number of things, Jesus says. So remember, for John, the unique deity of the one God consists of that loving, unified relationship between the Father and the Son. Jesus says the Spirit is that loving, personal presence that will come to live in his people, draw them into the love between the Father and the Son. 
And so Jesus says, his disciples are the ones who abide or remain in that divine blood. The way that branches are connected to a vine. He's describing here how the personal love of God can permeate a person, healing, transforming, and making a move. And there's more. The Spirit will also empower Jesus' followers to carry on his mission in the world. So first of all, fulfill the great command to love others through radical acts of service. But also, Jesus says, the mission is to bear witness to the truth, to expose and name the selfish, sinful ways that we as humans treat each other, and to declare that in Jesus, God has saved the world through him because he loves them. He's opened up a new way. And so finally, Jesus predicts that there will be opposition. Just as the Jewish leaders rejected him, so that his followers will be persecuted. But he tells them not to be afraid because he has already conquered or gained victory over the world. Now, what does Jesus mean by victory here? He doesn't say but it leads us into the final section of the book where John shows us what victory looks like, Jesus style. The Jewish leaders send soldiers to Jesus and his disciples to arrest him. And when the soldiers ask which one Jesus is, he declares, I am, and they fall backward. Now, this is brilliant on John's part. These words are the culmination of two sets of seven instances where Jesus has used that very phrase. And it all highlights one of John's core claims about Jesus. The words I am, or in Greek, ego and me, they're the Greek translation of the Hebrew personal covenant name of God that was revealed to Moses back in Exodus chapter 2. It was also repeated many times in Isaiah. And John has strategically placed seven moments in his story where Jesus says, I am, followed by some astounding claim. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world, the gate for the sheep the good shepherd, the resurrection, the way, the truth, and the life, the true vow. And John's also designed seven other stories that have key moments where Jesus says simply, I am, echoing this divine name. And so here, this occurrence, as Jesus is arrested, it's the ironic climax of all of them, because Jesus reveals his divine name and power and victory precisely at the moment that he gives up his life. After this, Jesus is put on trial for his exalted claims to be the Son of God and the King of Israel, first before the high priest and then before the Roman governor, who has to take seriously anyone who's charged with claiming to be the King of Israel. And Jesus tells Pilate that my kingdom is not from this world, meaning that he is a king and that his kingdom is for this world. But it's radically different value system, it's redefinition of power and greatness. None of this is derived from this world. Rather, they are defined by God's character that Jesus has revealed through his upside down kingdom, which is epitomized by the cross. It's the place where the world's true king conquers sin and evil by letting it conquer them. And Jesus gains victory over the world through an act of self giving love. After this, Jesus' body is placed in a tomb that was then sealed. And on the first day of the week, Mary and then later the other disciples discover that the tomb is strangely open and then empty. And then Mary, all of a sudden, she meets Jesus. He's alive from the dead. Now, the resurrection of Jesus connects back to another pattern of seven from John's gospel. So all the way back to the wedding party in Cana, when Jesus turned the water into wine, John told us that that was Jesus' first sign. And he also identified the second sign, the healing of the sick boy in chapter 3. But after this, John just lets you two count. And if you have, you'll have noticed that the sixth sign was the raising of Lazarus from the tomb, which Jesus performed at the cost of his own life. And so that and all of the signs, they point forward to this seventh and greatest sign at the culmination of the story, Jesus' own resurrection from it vindicates Jesus' claim to be the Son of God, the author of all life, whose love has conquered death itself. After the empty tomb, Jesus then meets up with all the disciples, and he commissions them by sending the Spirit as he promised, so that his mission from the Father can now be carried on to the rest. After this, the book concludes with an epilogue that explores the ongoing mission of Jesus' disciples in the world. So a number of them are fishing, and they're not catching anything. And so Jesus appears to them on the shore, and they don't recognize him. Yeah. And he tells them to cast their net on the other side of the river. And when they obey him, they catch a huge amount of fish, and it's only then that they recognize him as Jesus. 
Now, John is offering here a picture of discipleship to Teresa. His followers will be most effective in the world when their focus is not on their work as such, but on simply listening for Jesus' voice and obeying him when he speaks. That's when they will truly see him at work in their lives. After this, Jesus talks with Peter and then commissions him as a unique leader in the Jesus movement. They're indicating that he too will give up his life. But in contrast to Peter, the last moments of the story focus on the author of this gospel, the disciple who Jesus loved. And unlike Peter, his job was not to lead the Jesus movement, but rather to spend his long life bearing witness to Jesus so that others might believe. Him. And that's actually what he's done right here by offering this amazing story about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And that's what the Gospel of John is all about. I wish that I wish they had handouts of that. You know, mm -hmm. wouldn't that be great? Yeah. You gotta work cool. it to be a big favorite. Right. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. right. Or, um, but yeah, they are they uh, worth going back and Watching repeatedly, uh, they do. They they contain a lot of information, but between those two videos about John, each of which is about eight and a half minutes, you get a fabulous overview of the Gospel of God. A um, couple of translational things that I want to point out, which I think are are alluded to at least in this video. One is uh, he talks about Jesus saying, "I am." Uh, a lot. That's something that we miss in our translations, probably, because I think it's all, often translated into English as I am he. Um, yeah. And the the Greek words ego eimi, um really just mean I am. Uh, the, the, the Hebrew, when God reveals himself to Moses through the burning bush, and Moses wants to know what his name is, uh, God's reply is Hebrew, I think it's Ahia Asher Ahia. So we 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 use the Hebrew letters that kind of correspond to uh, you know Y H Y H um, to refer to, to God's divine. Um, but but those words Ahia Asher Ahia in Hebrew basically mean I am. So th th this is a direct translation. From Hebrew into Greek, um, and is a, a uh, it's one of the reasons Jesus gets into trouble. Whenever he says "I am," everybody knows what he's hinting at. The other translational issue that I think is interesting, again, John uh, kind of refers so much to the creation, to Genesis, to kind of this new creation. At the end of this video, he talks about Jesus uh, giving the Holy Spirit to his disciples. Uh, in our translation, it says Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, that Greek word that we translate as he breathed on them is intuseo, which literally is he breathed into them. And I don't know why we translate it that way. But who gets breathed into? Adam. That's right. So God makes this mud creature and breathed into it and gave him life. But so this is, a, I think, a clear reference to, to creation uh, and of Jesus as the source of life, breathing into them. Funny side I do remember hearing about some of them were baptizing and as soon as they bring them out on the water, it was actually Jesus down in their face. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Interesting. Anything, what did y'all notice? Anything from this video? Any questions or comments that you have? I 
it seemed very logical. It seemed very, very pointed on the first no, no question. It was, it was very direct. The language was clear. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. And it's just amazing the, the way that this gospel is structured, which, which they talk about the 70s and just the, you know, everything is done in such a, a deliberate and precise way. It's really pretty incredible. Did you actually just do the video? It's the Bible Project. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I think their website is simply BibleProject.com. You want to look and see if they have a segment on Psalm 82, but that's why I heard Mount Everest trying to help this Psalm 82. Yeah. Well, it's but a they, great tool for today because so many people, they don't want to. If they, if they have questions, well, you know, they, anybody knows it. Right, <laughs> that's, that's right. right. Well, I just can't. This is a very tool for me. I like the seven scenario. That's sort of a thing that just tumbles all the way through the story from Genesis. And then you, then you get to the book of Revelation, and it's one group of sevens after another group of sevens after another group of sevens. I think there's 54 of them totally in Revelation. So it, it's fun how, how all this is woven together and telling the story. So. And the Bible Project has videos on different books of the Bible, but it also has videos on different theological, you know, I think there's one on the Trinity. Uh, so, yeah, so they have, they have a lot of, a lot of good stuff. The, um, and they're attending to it all the time. That's yeah. 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 So, so look back in a month. You know, like yeah. Something, something yeah. Yeah. Really good. Good stuff. It's like you said, I mean, it's you know, you can it's a great mini series, <laughs> but most people aren't keeping biblical commentaries on figuring out what to, you know, which ones to look at and which ones to read when you give a book of the Bible. So, again, this is just a, a nice, easy resource, which you know, I can say from, from my standpoint, I, I feel like I've vetted pretty well. You can say. This is a this is a great reliable resource. They know their stuff. The again, the book of glory, most of it occurs with the, with the synoptics. Jesus, when he comes to Jerusalem at the end, he enters, goes to the temple, knocks everything over, and then he teaches publicly in the temple. And then you you know you've got him kind of hanging around the temple for a while. Um, I think in John Jesus comes into Jerusalem and goes almost straight to the upper room. So in the in the synoptics Jesus is telling all these parables. He's got this big public ministry uh, in Jerusalem, which is going to get him in trouble. In John he comes and really goes straight to the upper room and spends five or six chapters talking. Um, and he never uh, does not institute the Last Supper um, in John the way that he does. You know, all the other synoptics are very clear about, you know, him giving them bread and saying, this is my body, wine, this is my blood. He never does that in John. Um, in John, the, the act on that last night is the washing of the disciples. So... Very, very different. Uh, and and then the giving of the great commandment, which they refer to in the video. And most of you have been to a Maundy Thursday service, which is uh, a beautiful service. And it's also very, very complicated in a way because it celebrates the institution of Holy Communion. Celebrates that with a reading from the Gospel of John in which Jesus never institutes Holy Communion. Uh, the word Monday is derived from uh, the Latin mandate um, for the for the great commandment. And so there's all these things like mashed into into one uh, service, which I find 
at times theologically problematic, but the, the fact remains that it is one of the most powerful, I think one of the most powerful services in the church year. Yeah, we go to the National Cathedral on that whole Holy Week, and I've only seen it on the broadcast, but it really gets its own. Else, beautiful and complicated as it really is. And you'd love this. I've got a, a, a recording, and it's a of a choral setting, uh, Eucharistic setting, I guess. It was written by uh, Willen called Tenebrae Mondi Thursday. It's just stunning. You're gorgeous. So, any other questions? We are going to be uh, diving a little bit deeper into some of the I am statements uh, and the bread of life discourses. You know, in the synoptics, again, Jesus is going to feed by the 5,000 people, and that's pretty much it. And he's going to move on to the next thing. Uh, in John, Jesus is going to feed 5,000 people, and he's going to talk, talk and talk about it. So, um, so this summer, sometime in July, uh, and as I've mentioned before, uh, clergy people sometimes will try to plan vacations <laughs> during July because uh, there are five straight Sundays that are just the bread of life discourses. And so you've got to figure out what to say about the feeding of the 5,000 and what it means for five straight Sundays. It's a cow. Uh, but again, it's interesting. And even though it's not explicit, I think that a lot of biblical scholars might argue that in John, the feeding of the 5,000 is the institution of Holy Ghost, or is kind of a, uh, an equivalent in a sense. Very different, but similar. I can't think of anything else I really want to say about John. Do you have anything to add? No, uh, I guess the only thing I'd add is uh, I remember in seminary, uh, Jane and John Patterson talking about, you know, we just had the Gospel of John, as you said, our our central sacrament would be foot washing. And I, I love what John had to say about that. Not, not this John, John Lewis instructor. Um, he thought this was so important. He said, Jesus must have realized how much movement is involved in being a disciple. You know, and just think of all the ministries, you know, that we're engaged in and just caring for the part of you that is going up and doing all this ministry. That's great. Got to take care of those feet. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Thoughts on John's gospel? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all very much. Yeah. Thank you. Brief overview and two classes on John. Now we'll. Dig a little deeper, particularly into the I am statements and uh, John's version of, uh, of uh, the crucifixion and some of the difficult, problematic language. And we alluded to this last week uh, and at the beginning of this class. It's the way that, that John has this very negative portrayal of uh, the Jews. And that, that Greek word is probably better translated as Judeans. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. And you'll notice in today's gospel we, um, we have translated as Judeans. Yeah. So yeah, the, the, the Greek word is Judeo-I. So I think Judeans is, is a better translation and doesn't carry the same um, weight. Connotations as you say, the Jews. But again, we'll have yeah. some time to talk about Yeah, that. Like it's really to the Judaizers. What's that? How's that compared to the Judaizers? That would be okay as well. Yeah, I think that's a decent translation. 
Have you ever heard that? Have you heard that too? Yeah, we're in Galatians right now. Oh, 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 oh. I, I thought you meant that. Oh. Yeah. 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 Some translations I've seen from John are the Jewish leaders, mm -hmm. um, which may have been kind of implied, but it 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 really is it is inserting uh, a word and a meaning into the Greek that's not there. In my opinion, I think we have to be careful about how we translate that we try to translate in a way that is true to the text. There's been a lot of um, scholarship and work behind all this that we draw. Yeah. And every translation is by definition an approximation. And even the Greek is Jesus spoke Aramaic, uh, Aramaic, and so somebody had to take his Aramaic words, translate them into Greek. Now we're translating into English. It's not an easy or a simple project. Do you think some, something is left out doing that? Translate it twice? Oh, I'm sure lots of stuff is, was left out. And, you know, what we call the Bible uh, was assembled from, from scraps of texts. And um, so we, we have no idea. Nobody ever wrote down the Gospel of John and published it in here. So we've got fragments on vellum, and, you know, that, that we tried to piece together. But this is kind of an archaeological record that in time became, uh, it was decided this is the way that it is. And that was a long process and you know there was there was a lot of questions and this is relevant to, to John there's a lot of question about whether or not John was going to be included in the, in the uh, biblical canon. Uh, a lot of people wanted to leave it out because it sounded Gnostic to some degree it has this this sense of Gnosticism which was the what became the 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 heresy that the early church was fighting uh, against the most or was most concerned with. Mm -hmm. And then just the fact that John is so different and portrays such different events, um, both just factually and theologically, um, that a lot of people thought it just doesn't belong with these other gospels. And uh, I'm awfully, I, I have a, an ambivalent relationship with John, I guess, but I'm really grateful that it's like, Truth is not a matter of, it goes beyond just kind of the history or the biography of what happened. And I think John balances out the, uh, the synoptics in a really beautiful way. Presents us a, a fuller picture of who Jesus was. All right. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Do we get to hear you preach about John this morning? No, I preach on the Ten Commandments. Oh, I yeah, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> but it's very good. <laughs> so, hey, on uh, Tuesday, you what? On Tuesday, do you have anything going on on Tuesday? I don't know. Friends, though, if you want to, I was, I wanted to go down to the uh, seat. Uh, oh, I mean, I so I'm going to 